Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Gibraltar Stock Exchanges webinar. Uh, I think we uh, we thought after the year that we've all just had, uh, what a better way to cheer ourselves up than having a chat about Brexit, and in fact, not just Brexit, debt markets and the road ahead in the European region. So, just a little bit of um, housekeeping first of all. Uh, I'll say a few words, and I'm going to hand over to uh, Giuseppe uh, from the Gibraltar Stock Exchange, our head of execution and business development. Uh, we then have, I'll give a formal introduction with a full bio uh, when the speakers kick off, but we then, then have Eric Phillips, um, PSL counsel at Slaughter and May, who will be um, our first speaker. Uh, we then have Simon Brickles, uh, chairman of the Gibraltar Stock Exchange, and then we have um, Peter Howitt, MD and partner at Ince Group in Gibraltar. And then about 12-ish, 12 five past 12, we'll have a Q&A. Um, hopefully you can see in the um, GoToWebinar app, there's a questions box. Please feel free to post questions. We'll be collecting those questions um, during the speakers, uh, presentations, et cetera. And then we'll do our best uh, for the panel to wade through those questions at the end. And then I will wrap up the, um, the event, hopefully at 12.30 to make sure we're all on all on schedule. So that's the uh, that's the plan, so feel free to post your questions. Um, just um, So let's just take a step back in time. I think next month, it's five years since um, the 23rd of June, 2016. Uh, one of those sort of JFK moments, which you probably probably won't forget in a hurry. Um, and um, you know, if we just take a step back a year previous to um, June, 2016, the Conservatives basically won their majority. I don't think that was necessarily in the script. They had then had to uh, deliver on their promise to hold a, a vote and um, and then began a year's worth of um, of obviously all of the shenanigans, which has led to where we are today. And um, look, as Mark Twain once said, if you don't read the papers, you're uninformed. If you do read the papers, you're misinformed. And I think that's probably what we saw in the year leading up to Brexit. Um, my fellow director, interestingly, was in uh, the north of England about a week out from the vote. He was doing a family wedding and all sorts of stuff. And he called me and said, uh, outside the M25, it doesn't look like anybody is actually going to vote to remain. And uh, and those were probably the first signs of this is interesting. And then obviously that evening um, when, uh, when we went to bed and Sunderland was just coming through, that was when really we first saw the signs. And I think in Gibraltar particularly, you probably recall there's about 90 seven percent or, or a number around that voted to remain and uh, obviously as you can imagine the next day it was pretty uh pretty gloomy in, uh, in this jurisdiction gibraltar was your gateway to the eu so obviously we had a slight um slight hole below the water line in gibraltar's positioning interestingly actually what then happened is that in fact when the analysis was done about 97 percent of passporting out of Gibraltar was actually into the UK. I don't know whether you know, but about one in five cars in the UK is insured out of Gibraltar. And in fact, Gibraltar has since then managed to carve itself out, I think, in a unique position as a portal into the UK. And obviously, we will talk about that today. So I think Gibraltar does what Gibraltar often does, which is to, um, you know, basically create an opportunity where perhaps there's a, uh, there's a, there's a, a little bit of a negativity. And I think that's where we, we see ourselves moving forward. So um, let's move forward to introduce the speakers. Hopefully today we will try and separate a little bit of the uh, the wood from the trees and uh, the wheat from the chaff, and hopefully we won't have French fishermen blockading Jersey, uh, kibosh the uh, discussions moving forward, and, uh, and we look forward to um, a series of presentations. On that note, I will hand over to Giuseppe, who will say a few words, and uh, and then we'll go into the speakers. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for joining the webinar. Uh, very quickly on the Gibraltar Stock Exchange, really. We are a regulated stock exchange based in Gibraltar, obviously. We are licensed to list uh, structured products, debt securities, including uh, securitized and repackaged products, as well as funds. Uh, we are quite modern. We think we are customer and client oriented, uh, at the same time, market oriented stock exchange. We operate two markets. We have uh, a a uh, regulated market used to be a MIFI regulated market, now it's post Brexit, a regulated market, uh, and a AMTF market, uh, which we uh, use to list um, professional institutional uh, offerings um, um, and products. Uh, in terms of the our area of focus, we are obviously a smaller stock exchange, so we have really found a niche within the structured products and debt security space. Um, we have been able to provide um, a speed to market 
often quite cost-effective solutions to uh, those issuers who have a keen, who keep a keen eye on, you know, scalable arrangements in terms of cost, but also speed to market. Uh, this is quickly about us, really. Uh, also, just to say that we have been seeing a lot of issuances of structured products uh, pre-Brexit and post-Brexit. And really, the reason for wanting to organize this webinar uh, was driven by the uh, questions that um, have come up during our market discussions with Ishwa. Um, we have found that there might be a little bit of confusion and misconception around some of the quite tricky, I must say, um, uh, subjects of the post-Brexit scenario for the debt market. Um, uh, we thought that a open discussion with a panel of experts would be a good way of trying to address some of those issues. Um, in terms of the a view of the exchange, we have formed our own view, and obviously this is going to be investigated further by the speakers. Uh, but we are uh, of the view that from a stock exchange perspective, we have seen little to no change. Um, post Brexit uh, to uh, professional institutional um, offerings. Um, fr from our perspective, those those products will be listed on the MTF market. Um, uh, probably the impact of the Brexit um, effect has been very little. Um, I think uh, market participants, some market participants, believe that the key issue post Brexit are those relating to the loss of passporting rights. Uh, for uh, fixed income prospectuses, uh, both uh, European and UK, you know, who wish to passport into, um, you know, the other jurisdictions. Um, we do believe, and probably the speakers, we talk about this a bit further, uh, that the impact will be quite minimal. This is just our view. Uh, in terms of documentation, uh, the requirements remi remain uh, very similar, if not, if not identical in some areas. And obviously, the uh, drafting will follow those requirements, and therefore, uh, probably in terms of approval, there will be a different, a different process. But the production and documentation will probably be uh, pretty much aligned to what we saw before Brexit. Um, perhaps it will be more a matter of market participant becoming more familiar and uh, you know, um, you know, digesting uh, the new process ahead. Uh, well, on um, this note, I hand back to Nick to introduce the speaker so that uh, allow them to begin with presenting their views. And thank you so much for uh, joining the webinar today. Thanks, Giuseppe. So let me introduce our first speaker, Eric Phillips, PSL Counsel at Slaughter and May. Uh, he focuses primarily on debt capital markets and securitization. Uh, Eric regularly writes and speaks on a range of topics, including the LIBOR transition, sustainable finance, and Brexit, and is active on a number of trade association working groups active in the capital markets. Um, Eric recently published the article, Brexit Has Happened, so what next for debt capital markets, which is perfect for this for this uh, webinar, uh, Slaughter and May Insights. And Eric is now going to talk about EU, UK financial services market access rights in respect of fixed income and structured products markets. Eric, over to you. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Giuseppe. I hope that everyone can hear me. So, Nick, as you said, we're now in the middle of May 2021. We're coming up to the, close to the fifth year anniversary of when the UK and together with it Gibraltar voted to leave the European Union. And we're also coming up to close to the fifth month anniversary of 31 December 2020, which is the date that the UK and together with it Gibraltar left the EU's single market. So that was when Brexit took effect economically, if you like. So what do we mean? So I'm going to talk a little bit this morning about where we currently are as a matter of law and regulation, and also what we're seeing in practice, how market participants are dealing and documenting the new reality. And I'm also going to briefly mention where we might go from here. So firstly, the UK and Gibraltar have left the EU single market. Um, I often get questions about what this actually means. So to be precise, um, EU regulations are no longer directly applicable in the UK or Gibraltar. So something like the EU's market abuse regulation, it no longer applies to UK market participants. 
and also EU directives, um, the UK and Gibraltar no longer have an obligation to implement EU directives such as the EU's transparency directive. So that's been the case since the um, 31st of December. And also certain passporting rights that um, were relevant under the EU single market, those passporting rights no longer exist from the EU to the UK or Gibraltar or vice versa. And, as, and another key difference is that EU law no longer has primacy over UK or Gibraltar law and regulation. And instead, um, the, the UK and Gibraltar and the EU can now regulate separately. So the trading relationship between the EU and the UK and Gibraltar now is on the basis of the new um, trade and cooperation agreement, which, as you might recall, was agreed on a political level on Christmas Eve last year and has applied since the um, 1st of January this year. Now, that um, new trade and cooperation agreement barely touches the technical detail of financial services trade. So effectively, from the position of um, market participants in the debt capital markets or in structured finance, we are now operating between the UK and the EU on the basis of a so-called no deal Brexit. So one of the key points that I wanted to mention was that because EU law and regulation no longer apply in the UK or the or Gibraltar, from the beginning of this year, under um, regulation that the UK and Gibraltar put in place, there was a sort of a gigantic copying and pasting exercise whereby to avoid gaps in the UK's and Gibraltar's um, statute book, existing EU law was onshored into the UK's and Gibraltar's regulatory framework with sort of relatively minor tweaks so that it um, could work outside the context of the EU single market. So that's a sort of a very brief um, overview of what happened as a matter of law and regulation at the beginning of this year. So where does this leave market participants and how are people dealing with this change in practice? Well, this really is the sort of the more interesting question, the million dollar question. It's the question that we couldn't necessarily have predicted an answer to back in um, 2016 when, when everyone voted. Um, and it's also interesting because at the back end of last year, when many of us were advising on lots of transactions, we didn't know during most sort of no, even at November, December of last year, exactly what would happen. We didn't know whether there would be a deal at all. Um, market participants were documenting transactions sort of without knowing um, the legal framework that would apply to those transactions. Still, it has turned out that notwithstanding COVID, notwithstanding Brexit, um, the back half of 2020, the beginning of 2021, has been a sort of a very busy time for the debt capital markets. We've advised on sort of many transactions that have closed successfully during that period. And we've also sort of seen many that have occurred in the markets. So how have those transactions been done, notwithstanding Brexit? Well, sort of, it turns out that the reality of the way that most of the um, debt capital markets and structured finance markets work in the, in the European region is that most of them are done on what's called a wholesale basis. So they're done, um, so most of the denominations of those deals are high denominations, so more than a uh, 100,000 euro minimum denomination. And most of them are aimed at sort of qualified or sort of institutional investors. So these transactions are less regulated in the EU and less regulated in the UK. And effectively, um, a UK issuer 
can make can continue to make offers to EU institutional investors without requiring necessarily an EU prospectus and vice versa. So we're continuing to see, um, so from a market access perspective, not much has changed in reality from a, um, a wholesale debt perspective. We are obviously seeing some differences in terms of documentation and the way that sort of transactions are drafted to deal with a new reality. So the first thing that people have been thinking about, and this has been something that they've been thinking about sort of ever since um, the referendum was first talked about, is risk factors. So an issuer needs to um, put within its public offer documentation risks relevant to its business, risks relevant to the securities. So we have tended to see lots of Brexit risk factors in the past. Now we're starting to see um, slightly fewer of these. That's because Brexit is no longer a theoretical event that might occur in the future, but a real event that has already occurred in the past. So it's no longer appropriate to put in a risk factor dealing with uncertainty because there, there is now much less uncertainty. Obviously, to the extent that a particular issuer or a particular asset class this business has maybe changed fundamentally because of Brexit, it might be important to disclose this. But that's probably um, something that we will see less of as the, as the months and the years pass. So, we'll, so another sort of interesting documentation change is that um, we're now having to distinguish clearly within documentation EU law and, e and retained EU law. So EU law is sort of single market regulation. Retained EU law is what the UK and Gibraltar have put in place to replace EU law. So that is a sort of a tricky drafting and disclosure point for lawyers. Um, we found that relatively tricky for sort of repeat deals in the first couple of months of this year. There is now already a sort of a vast body of market practice out there and we're finding that now much less of a challenge. And I should also mention that the International Capital Market Association's standard documentation that deals with some of these questions, that's being um, widely adopted. So that's the wholesale debt capital market. So to summarize, Brexit for this market segment is um, primarily a drafting and documentation challenge rather than a market um, access challenge. Now, a couple of other things that we were sort of wondering about in the lead up to the end of this year, would issuers um, start making changes to the types of structures that they were putting in place? Would there be changes to the governing law that they were choosing for their documentation? Would this, and sort of interestingly for this panel, would they be making changes to their sort of choice of trading venue or stock exchange? Now, we have in fact continued to see English law continue to be used um, sort of very widely for the international debt capital markets. Um, I'm qualified as an English lawyer. You'll never sort of hear someone like me say that English law can't be used for the debt capital markets. Um, obviously, there's the specific scenario of EU regulated banks and um, regulatory capital, where in some cases um, they're putting language within their documentation um, contractually recognizing um, EU bail in. But outside that specific scenario, we're continuing to see English law being widely used in the international debt capital markets. Now, so coming on to um, choice of stock exchange, we have not, in fact, observed a sort of a significant change in um, choice of stock exchanges by issuers. So sort of typically where an issuer had previously chosen, I don't know, the London Stock Exchange or the Gibraltar Stock Exchange, the reasons for that choice continue to be relevant. Equally, we're continuing to see um, many issuers in the debt capital markets to choose exchanges like Euronex Dublin or the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. And obviously, despite being on this panel, um, 
we as lawyers, we are sort of neutral as to stock exchange choice. We simply advise our clients as to sort of the range of options available to them. And in fact, we see it as a good thing that there is sort of healthy competition among stock exchanges and a range of different choices available to issuers. Um, this simply gives sort of issuers a little bit more flexibility in um, what they choose. Now, there has been a sort of a somewhat interesting discussion over the last few months over whether it might make sense for some issuers to sort of consolidate all their securities either within the EU or within the UK. But we're actually still seeing some issuers, for example, with perhaps their equity in the EU, but their debt in either um, London or Gibraltar. So, those, so they are subject to, for example, the EU market abuse regulation in relation to their equity, but perhaps the sort of the UK market abuse regulation for their debt. Now that sort of raises the question of a sort of a theoretical dual compliance burden. Is this going to become sort of too onerous for those issuers? I think at this point, most issuers are sort of adopting a wait and see approach. We don't yet really know how divergent UK and EU regulation will become. We also don't know whether there will be technical fixes. For example, the UK could unilaterally recognise the EU's market abuse regulation, sort of, and this would maybe reduce the dual compliance burden. So there were still quite a lot of open questions. And while there have been some issuers that have sort of rethought their choice of stock exchange, the majority haven't. And um, I think a lot of issuers are adopting a wait and see approach. So what's going to happen in the future? Well, nobody knows. I think that we have not really seen um, the EU hasn't really granted the UK and Gibraltar equivalents in most areas of financial services. Far be it for me to sort of comment on the political mood mu music there, but we don't necessarily envisage there to be sort of many more equivalence declarations in the future. This is partly because sort of at the beginning of this year, when the UK's regulatory framework was sort of almost exactly the same as the EU's regulatory framework. If there weren't equivalence decisions made at that point, it's perhaps difficult to see that they will be made in the future as the two frameworks start to diverge further. What I do think is that for the wholesale debt capital markets, I do envisage that under any scenario, market participants will continue to be able to access sort of both EU um, regulated investors and also UK regulated investors on the basis of the same documentation and the same structures. But, but famous last words and um, back to you, Nick. Harry, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. And I'm sure there's going to be some questions for you at the end. Thank you. OK, we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Simon Brickles. So Simon is the chairman of the Gibraltar Stock Exchange. He's my boss. Um, he's the former head of AIM of the London Stock Exchange and the former CEO of Plus Markets Group in the United Kingdom. Uh, Simon's a highly experienced director who spent the last 25 years developing and operating rules for commodity and equities markets and other types of financial products and markets around the world. He served on the boards, stock exchanges, as well as private and publicly quoted companies. So Simon is now going to talk about the changing landscape of UK and Gibraltar regulated stock exchanges over to you, Simon. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. And since we've uh, uh, already heard from uh, Eric of Slaughter and May, I'm not going to uh, concentrate on uh, legal niceties. Rather, I'm going to talk about the commercial uh, position post-Brexit, uh, how uh, issues are impacted, or more particularly, how they're not. I thought it was very interesting uh, on that topic that Eric is not experiencing particular difficulties at the moment. And one might readily have supposed that in the uh, initial uh, periods of us exiting the EU, that would have been when uh, problems and uncertainties were uh, most at the uh, forefront. 
So let's concentrate on uh, what we already know. Uh, and what we already know is that Gibraltar is going to remain uh, an important gateway into the UK. Uh, when the United Kingdom was within Europe, uh, other member states treated it as part of the uh, UK uh, for passporting uh, purposes. Um, uh, rather anonymously, though, it wasn't treated as part of the UK under uh, English law, a bit like uh, uh, immigrants having more rights under EU law than they got under uh, domestic law. But all of that was put right over 20 years ago uh, with the Gibraltar Order of 2001 uh, that was made under the uh, Financial Services and Markets Act. And this, this established the bilateral rights between uh, the Gibraltar uh, and UK in UK uh, uh, law. Post-Brexit, uh, the UK and the Gibraltar governments have agreed that Gibraltar licensed firms will continue to be able to provide their services into the UK markets, set up branches in the UK on the strength of uh, uh, Gibraltarian licenses. Uh, transitional arrangements have already uh, been confirmed between the two, and both Gibraltar and the United Kingdom are committed to continuing uh, the special relationship long term. Already in the UK, we've had the financial services uh, bill, which started its passage through Parliament at the back end of last year. Uh, and the new uh, uh, bill, when it's enacted, uh, will give the Gibraltar authorization uh, regime legal standing and provide for the mutual access and aligned standards and financial services between uh, the UK and Gibraltar. And there's matching legislation in uh, Gibraltar. Uh, which basically mirrors that of the UK to ensure the bilateral rights. So uh, this is really important, I think, given the uh, dominance and importance of the UK in financial services. Uh, already we've um, uh, ensured that um, quoted Eurobond uh, exemptions will uh, remain. Uh, basically, the, uh, uh, the relationship between the UK and Gibraltar is uh, uh, going to be pretty much set in stone and set to continue. And that's going to be important for a whole host uh, of uh, uh, issuers. In terms of the UK uh, uh, and indeed European issuers generally, many issuers never needed to produce a prospectus. Uh, and I think uh, that's going uh, to continue uh, to be important, and I'll touch on that uh, a little bit more uh, in a moment. Uh, as Eric's mentioned, in terms of the UK uh, and Gibraltar's relationship with the rest of Europe, uh, there are now separate regimes. Uh, the UK has adopted the vast bulk of uh, prospectus law and other um, uh, EU financial services law into uh, domestic law. Now, I don't want to dwell upon the instruments themselves and the regulations. There, there are various ones on the official listing of securities regulations, the prospectus EU regulation, quite a few others. The point is that the Treasury officials have done their work in this regard so that uh, the likes of uh, issuers, myself, uh, whatnot, don't have to do. There'll be some getting used to those new regulations and referring to them from uh, our lawyer's point of view, but that's why we have specialists like Eric and other lawyers. From an issuer's point of view, the point is the job has been done uh, and the, um, uh, the citation of the relevant statutes and uh, instruments will be made in, uh, in prospectuses. And we can rely on our lawyers as we always did uh, to uh, address uh, those issues. Uh, I think the essential point is that for UK issuers, uh, prospectus law remains essentially uh, uh, the same. Uh, some bits like ESMA guidance haven't been uh, formally adopted, uh, but I think uh, basically you've got two parallel uh, legal uh, jurisdictions with the Treasury taking on the role of the Commission uh, uh, in domestic uh, UK law. Uh, it's clearly the case that um, the UK and Gibraltar have been adhering to European uh, directives and regulations for a very uh, long time. In, in fact, some may say, though I wouldn't uh, venture to say this in a public forum myself, that the FSA has actually gold-plated uh, a number of EU uh, uh, directives, and in certain uh, areas, UK uh, requirements have been interpreted at a stricter level. Uh, than uh, is what pertains in the rest of the uh, EU. 
Uh, Eric touched on uh, the benefits of English law, and of course they don't just pertain to things like uh, prospectuses and so on. I think many issuers have historically used uh, English law because it covers a whole multitude of different things that are relevant to issuers, corporate law, debt law, insolvency law, uh, accounting law, uh, and in some European jurisdictions there are uh, noticeable gaps uh, in, in legislation. I think English law is a comprehensive body of law uh, which um, uh, assists uh, issues. So I would anticipate that that comparative advantage will continue and people will continue to use the exchanges that they've used before because of the wider economies of scale, not just English law, but the fact that um, uh, various uh, brokers, institutions, uh, investors, legal advisors, accountancy firms, uh, are, are located in London and in Gibraltar and will continue to uh, benefit uh, issuers with that advice. What it does mean, of course, is that the automatic recognition of uh, prospectuses uh, ceases. If you get a UK or Gibraltar stamp and you want to do an offering in the EU, you're going to have to get um, a, a separate uh, stamp. Of course, as I mentioned, the um, the uh, same exemptions from prospectus uh, law will still apply in the UK as have always applied. Eric touched on institutional offerings, the whole host of exemptions that you've got in particular circumstances under the EU uh, directives will continue to pertain and give choices to issuers, noticeably in respect of uh, NTF platforms uh, that will continue post-Brexit um, uh, post as it always um, uh, has done. I think um, when we look at the longer term relationship and whether we get equivalents or not, probably not, but none of us uh, really know, we, we have to put all of this in perspective. It's very easy to get hung up on uh, the prospectus element of uh, an offering. Uh, and the, the truth is, investors do not make their decisions on what's in a prospectus. There are a number of hoops that people have to go through, but they're not primarily relying on prospectuses, which are often unreadable documents, frankly, uh, from an investor uh, point of view. They're looking at who your broker is, they're looking at what your offering is, they're looking at who's done your accounts, they're looking at the attractiveness of the management, they're looking at the track record, they're looking at all sorts of different things. So, uh, whilst there will now be an additional stamp, I think we've got to get that into uh, uh, perspective uh, from the point of view, what difference will it make to uh, us, the issuers? And when we're looking at issuers, uh, the work that your accountant does, the work that your broker does, uh, the vast majority of the work that the lawyer does will uh, remain uh, the same. Uh, we shouldn't be under the... Uh, uh, illusion that the previous single market was perfect and without its twiddly bits. I, I, I don't use that as a precise legal phrase, but we all know we've done issues in different uh, countries that there, it has been liaison with competent authorities and that competent authorities uh, have needed certain things doing in respect of certain types of issues and so on. So the, the previous single uh, market regime was not uh, uh, perfect. I think instead of getting your lawyer to advise now that broadly uh, you can do things, you now have to get them to advise on uh, what you might have to do. But really, it was ever thus. And I think in the overall context of uh, getting an issue ready for market, all the work that you do on the accounts, all the work that you do on the underlying issue, all the work that you already do on the uh, uh, prospectuses, we're, we're really speaking about footnotes to the lawyers' bills here in, in, in overall terms of uh, getting on to uh, a market. Of course, uh, Nick mentioned that I was at AIM. When I was at AIM, we had endless issuers that chose to do uh, an offering in Australia uh, and Canada, as, uh, as well as the UK, despite the fact that they were different regimes. And they did that for uh, their own commercial reasons, maybe they wanted some investors in their home uh, jurisdictions. And the fact was, even with those jurisdictions, where there is a different uh, regime, uh, the bulk of the work was exactly the same. And some issuers chose uh, to uh, appeal to 
uh, uh, extra lots of investors. And even within the UK market, that was always the case. You know, you could only approach certain investors if you were a certain size. Some of them will want you to apply uh, AIB guidelines and so on. Uh, and, and this will continue. Uh, companies and issuers will still be free to decide that they want to follow ESMA uh, guidelines. Indeed, the FSA has been encouraging them to do so. And if you want to do uh, a pan-European issue, you, you can do an EU prospectus uh, and you can comply with uh, ESMA guidelines. But of course, what this is actually doing is giving issuers uh, a little bit more uh, choice. And I think that's a good thing. That's always existed. I mean, in the UK, we've had the standard uh, listing, the EU standard listing, and there's been additional things you can do to get a premium listing if you think that is suitable for your issuer and if you think that is suitable uh, for uh, your uh, investors. So uh, I, I think not that much uh, will really uh, change uh, in substance in commercial terms. Um, a, a lot's been said uh, about uh, equivalents. Uh, Lord Hill at the moment is making certain uh, recommendations. None of us know uh, quite how far the UK regime may uh, diverge. Uh, I think Lord Hill's proposals have been cleverly constructed so that they don't um, interfere with the general rubric of European directives, but they do provide a slight competitive edge. And uh, where I would say that uh, is evident is at the moment, if you go on to an RIE, a regulated market, uh, then you are obliged to do a prospectus. He's proposing that that is not the case anymore, and that will give an extra rung on the ladder. It will provide an extra tier of choice uh, for uh, issuers as to what they do. Of course, if you want to do uh, an offering in the EU and you want to do the full prospectus, that will still be open to you as it is at the moment. What you're going to get is more choice. So what I would say about equivalence is it, it, it's clearly a vexed political issue. It, it's not just because junior French ministers want to use it as um, uh, leverage to discuss fishing rights. It, it, it's a wider uh, political thing. Uh, it's because the EU are not certain how far the UK will adopt what they call the Singapore model. Uh, the Singapore model, of course, being what we used to call the British model, and Lord Hill being like Lee Kuan Yew, uh, a good Cambridge graduate. Uh, what I'm really saying is if we do go down uh, that pathway of additional uh, divergence, I don't think that's something that issues should be uh, scared of necessarily. I think an EU passport will always be valid in the EU. I think it's going to be recognised for what it is uh, in the UK, but I think there could well be an even wider range of choices which will benefit issuers if we do diverge more. And of course, that's potentially important because one of the problems of capital markets is not all the legal niceties, it's that they have not been attractive to enough issuers. So I'll leave that thought dangling there, uh, doubtless controversially, because I actually think that if there is more divergence, that could be very interesting. But I think the overall message is not that much is changing. I, I don't want to be really boring about this, but not that much is changing in practical terms. People like Eric will have to cite different laws. People will have a slightly different liaison with other European authorities if you want to do a European offering than they do at the moment. But I, I think the practical uh, the, the practical lesson is not that much is likely to change really from an issues commercial perspective. Simon, that was fascinating. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll move on to our, uh, last but not least, our third speaker, Peter Howitt. Peter is a managing partner and director at INTS Group here in Gibraltar. Uh, an experienced lawyer, Peter and INTS are one of GSX uh, member firms, provides listing services to a number of issuers. Uh, INTS acts as a member firm, for one of the largest structured products manufacturers and has listed over 2,000 securities to date on the Gibraltar Stock Exchange MTF professional market over the last couple of years. Peter's key areas of specialism are finance, e-payments and cryptocurrency. Peter's been at the forefront of the innovative and rapidly expanding areas of e-commerce and fintech law since 2000. Peter founded Ramparts in 2012, which is now part of the INTS group. And Peter is going to talk about Gibraltar and the UK financial markets access and passporting. Peter, over to you. 
I, I think uh, Eric and Simon have done a very good job of actually covering most of the ground that I could talk about. And um, I think the main thing to note, as has been noted, is that we do have now um, a interim regime for deemed passporting between Gibraltar and the UK. Um, there is a uh, an authorization regime, the Gibraltar authorization regime, which is going to be uh, developed and implemented, which will which will give a more detailed underpinning to the relationship between the UK and Gibraltar. Um, it's fair to say that. Uh, the view on the ground here is that given all the other things that are going on for the UK and Gibraltar with other uh, countries and the EU, um, it may be that the interim arrangement currently in place for deemed passporting will continue for longer than perhaps um, was a, a initially uh, envisaged because it's not considered to be um, a massive priority because the relationship between the UK and Gibraltar is such that um, there isn't much concern between those, those territories in terms of um, access uh, to the UK market from Gibraltar. Um, at the moment, as people may know, Gibraltar and the UK are busy looking at other things that are actually more, uh, more of a priority. We have the um, discussions about Schengen, uh, which is um, uh, the Schengen area and Gibraltar being part of it, which is a, a very important um, uh, milestone that's, that, that's coming up. Um, we have uh, until uh, June, we think, when an agreement could be made. Um, we're seeing interest from individuals and businesses um, already um, uh, for uh, people to become resident in Gibraltar on the basis that um, that goes ahead and it makes it easy for people to move within the Schengen area from Gibraltar. There's lots of uh, tricky political issues involved in that negotiation, uh, as there always are, and particularly when Spain and Gibraltar are involved because of their historic relationship. So we, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, details that still need to be ironed out. So the sense I've got is that the current arrangement for uh, uh, firms that are authorised and wish to provide services into the UK can continue as long as it needs to until Gibraltar and the UK need to focus on it um, and put in place uh, something a little bit more um, structured. Now, one of the points I think that um, is not clear to me and, and, and perhaps Eric uh, uh, may have a better insight because he's more of a specialist in this area, I think is the um, arrangements for prospectuses between Gibraltar and the UK. As far as I can tell, um, that's an area that, that will need some more thought in terms of the development of the uh, GAR or Gibraltar authorization regime um, in terms of, you know, it, would there be um, an understanding that Gibraltar could in fact be a competent authority? Um, I'm not sure. Um, uh, whether whether that is a is a necessary arrangement to put in place, but for regulated firms, leaving aside um, the issue documentation for firms that undertake regulated activities like insurers, um, financial services businesses, banks, um, the arrangement in force at the moment between Gibraltar and the UK is perfectly adequate. Um, in fact, uh, interestingly, speaking to the finance centre, the um, applications for authorization for uh, licensing in Gibraltar to take advantage of the uh, deemed passporting increased recently. Um, so uh, leaving the EU, um, uh, you may have thought would have led, and we were all concerned, as you remember, Nick, about what the, the impact would be. You may have thought, well, this would have led to a big drop in activity. We did see some um, firms that uh, a small number of firms that relied on their Gibraltar authorization to conduct regulated activities into the EU. And we saw some of those restructure, um, but we're actually seeing a lot of firms coming to Gibraltar um, and more than, than, than did uh, pre-exit pre um, in order to uh, benefit from the, um, the relationship with the UK. And we think that's going to continue to grow. We're seeing um, insure tech businesses moving here. Uh, we've got uh, banking. Um, we also have, although it's not a harmonized area, we also have a lot of um, so-called distributed ledger technology businesses moving to Gibraltar. Um, and I think that's interesting in terms of the divergence point that's been mentioned a few times. And, and I think you know, Simon's uh, view uh, it, it, it appears to me to be correct, which is, you know, if, 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 uh, and as Eric said, if we're not going to have equivalence, which seems unlikely and mutual recognition for um, authorization, then um, what would be the point of not diverging? You know, the, 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 for those areas in which there is now sovereignty 
to create your own laws and your regulations, it would be uh, preposterous not to take advantage of the ability to create um, an environment which is attractive to business. Um, and I think you know the UK is definitely focused on that. We're seeing that in a number of areas. And Gibraltar has always been uh, focused on that because it has to fight hard, um, given its uh, size and its um, resources to try and attract businesses. So I think the, you know, this, this, um, where we're gonna go with divergence is obviously a politically sensitive subject, um, but we're already seeing on, for example, uh, collective investment schemes, uh, clients from Europe asking about um, the extent to which there may be uh, differences between AFMD in Europe and um, the management of uh, uh, fund managers in Gibraltar. Um, and in fact, on things like uh, cryptocurrency funds, um, that becomes very important because um, the funds regime in Europe doesn't necessarily work very well um, once you get above 100 million uh, euros for cryptocurrency funds because it's not being drafted for those kinds of um, uh, financial assets. It's been drafted for, for assets which have, uh, are more traditional financial instruments. So overall, the, the view is that the Gibraltar-UK um, regulatory relationship and legislative framework will be developed um, and enhanced. But at the moment, it's not broke, so we don't need to fix it. We'll continue with the interim arrangement. And I think the, the interesting discussion then becomes, um, where are those areas where Gibraltar and the UK can actually have a competitive advantage? where we, we accept that we don't have, um, uh, we're not part of the common market, we don't have uh, the same authorization rights, um, but we, um, we take advantage effectively of, 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 of the new ability uh, to do things slightly differently. Peter, thank you. Okay, that wraps up the, uh, the speakers. We are slightly ahead of our timetable, which is good news. Um, okay, we've had some questions coming in during the presentations. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to kick off with the questions and basically put it to the, the three panelists and let them um, fight over who should answer the questions. So the first one we've got in is, is ESMA recognition important for stock exchanges and European investors? Over to you, panel. I'll start by offering a couple of thoughts on this. I think that sort of as we've all said um, during our sort of individual speeches, based on the fact that we've not seen a significant change in practice, and most issuers have not changed their trading venue, I think that we can conclude fairly safely that for most regulated investors, for most issuers, um, ESMA recognition is not in fact important. I mean, we are aware that this does sometimes come up on um, transactions. Um, we think that this is part sometimes due to a misunderstanding, or sometimes it's because particular regulated investors have within their policies a preference for, for example, an EU regulated market or an EU multilateral trading facility. Now that mandate that they have doesn't necessarily derive from um, a regulatory necessity. So sometimes it's worth entering into a discussion specifically with that investor to find out whether it really is important. Um, I think that's sort of always worth getting to the bottom of whether sort of the actual reasons for, that, for why that question has come up, whether it's a real reason or not. Eric, thank you. I, I, I think that's certainly right, Eric. Investors give a lot of reasons to do with their mandate or size or this or that or the other for not accepting an issue, and that may or may not be what's driving their commercial decision. Uh, I do know from my own experience, years ago, we decided that AIM would not be a regulated market anymore, and we had all of these concerns about what would the investor mandates be and so on and so forth. If we made it... Um, uh, an MTF. It took me about six or nine months to get it through the stock exchange. It took me three weeks to sell it to the market. Nobody was interested. They'd already got uh, uh, the mandates and the few that hadn't pretty 
quickly change them. The sort of investors who are issued in a particular type of issues will probably have the flexibility in their mandates already, and if not, and they're you know, uh, generally going to be interested in your type of issue, uh, they will change. Okay, we've got a question about retail products. Um, what are the main points that issuers offering retail products in both EEA and UK markets need to consider when drafting and filing listing slash offering documents? Eric's probably worth you starting with this one, I think. Yeah, so this is the sort of the somewhat more difficult question. I think during when I was speaking earlier, I was focusing on the wholesale debt markets. So I think that sort of the first, the sort of the easy initial answer is that um, you cannot make a public offering, so an offering to retail debt investors um, in the UK using an EU prospectus or in the EU using a UK prospectus. Um, so effectively, you will need to comply with a prospectus that is approved by both the um, a UK or Gibraltar authority and also by um, an EEA competent authority. So that's a dual compliance burden. Having said that, there may be ways around this. Um, we think because the two prospectus regimes are currently highly aligned, it shouldn't be too difficult to, to use one document that can comply with both regimes and have the two approval processes running in parallel. Somewhat interestingly, I think I took a look yesterday to see whether there were any debt issuers that were taking this approach. There has not in fact been a single prospectus that has been approved by both, um, a single debt prospectus approved by both sort of UK or Gibraltar competent authority or an EEA competent authority this year. There have been, I think, a couple of equity prospectuses. So I think that the debt markets can draw inspiration for how the equity markets are operating. But perhaps it's worth sort of reflecting as to why nobody in the debt markets has done this yet. Perhaps there isn't necessarily really a need for it. I think that probably for a majority of sort of issuers they don't necessarily have a funding need that involves retail investors both in the eu and in the uk slash gibraltar now we might wonder why that's been the case why retail debt markets are relatively localized um, nobody really knows the answer to this question but sort of one theorized answer. I think that the International Capital Markets Association put out a paper um, in the last couple of years talking about the much smaller retail debt market that there is across the European region now compared to a few years ago. Some people have said that this is because um, retail debt markets are now extremely regulated, so much so that effectively it's a disincentive for issuers. So we have, for example, MIFID product governance requirements, we have PRIPS requirements, we have sort of onerous prospectus requirements, and perhaps um, sort of the, the burden of this regulation is sort of heavier than the, the benefit of accessing retail debt markets. Now, there may also be other reasons that are sort of separate from regulation. Perhaps in the UK, for example, investors maybe have tax reasons why they invest in other products for their pensions rather than investing in um, retail bonds. Now, I don't know whether this is necessarily going to change. I continue to think that retail debt products will be highly regulated, both in the EU and also in the UK slash Gibraltar. We've had the sort of relatively recent scandal in the UK of the London capital and finance case. I, don't, I think that experience isn't going to sort of incentivize um, the, the UK to become a Singapore upon Thames, at least in that specific area. The questions for the wholesale debt markets are entirely different, I think. Thank you very much. I, I, I think I don't know. 
I think I'd endorse with what Eric uh, has just said. Uh, uh, Pre-Bex, if you're doing a retail offering, it's a hell of a lot of work. And for most issuers, that's basically what puts them off. The cost is prohibitive. Um, uh, Post-Brexit, it will continue to be a hell of a lot of work, but you'll need two stamps atop uh, the work that you do rather than one stamp. And I don't see that as being an area where there's likely to be a lot of liberalisation anytime soon uh, on, on either side of the channel. I think on that point, is, I, was, I was only going to I was only going to add that I think the um, the changes in terms of the SME uh, growth market um, uh, we have we have to see how that um, improves yeah. matters within the EU because it's, you know to Eric's point and 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 Simon's the you know the, the the hurdles you need to jump through in terms of approval means that there's a whole area of the market that would like to access capital but but, but can't. Um, and we'll see whether uh, having a easier, simpler way of um, uh, of doing certain prospectuses for um, within the EU will 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 uh, un unleash some of that capital. I think the other point to make is the you know the choice of jurisdiction for an issuer in terms of um, uh, uh, choosing your home state. If you're not, uh, if you have some choice, if you're outside of the EU. And you need to have a, uh, uh, you need to decide um, uh, that you that you know where where's the right place either to become authorised or to have a issuing document approved, and that becomes very important. And I think our our, our job as lawyers who are now uh, no longer able to give uh, EU legal opinions um, that is a slight change, which I'm a bit annoyed about actually. Um, but uh, our job is actually to direct clients to the more um, sympathetic, suitable, practical. Uh, member state regulators uh, within the EU for those for those circumstances where it's unavoidable that they have to be approved or stamped there. I think there's many other um, uh, difficulties with the retail market. Even if we went back uh, to the simple regime where we used to have stock exchange admission documents, they weren't nearly as lengthy or difficult to read as. Uh, EU prospectuses have become. Uh, the fact is that the financial services regime as a whole makes it enormously expensive and difficult to do a retail offering. You know, the FCA will be all over if you're doing a retail offering. If you want to do one, you can continue to do one. It's the same amount of palaver broadly as it was before, but it is still sadly going to be a palaver. <laughs> I just want to sort of add to that, Simon. You've sort of raised the interesting point about the Lord Hill reforms and what's next on the regulatory agenda in the UK. Now, in my mind, there's a sort of a question over what the focus is in Treasury and what the sort of initial most important key wins are. Now, lots of the Lord Hill reforms of the UK's listing regime were very much aimed at the equity capital markets, things like SPACs and um, IPOs and so forth. Now, the prospectus regime as a whole is within the scope of that, but um, so the flavour of all the proposals is very much the um, equity markets rather than the debt markets. So perhaps that's sort of seen as the more immediate political priority. Yeah. I think it's interesting that um, we have in the last couple of years in the equity capital markets seen some sort of quite significant technological developments. I think there's been some sort of new web-based platforms such as Primary Bid that have sort of made it somewhat easier for um, retail investors to invest in equity. And I think that there's sort of a lot of issuers are taking advantage of this product. Um, particularly sort of for UK um, retail investors in equity. Now, some of that technology, I don't see why it couldn't technically be used for the debt markets, but I think sort of for whatever reason, um, some of these sort of web-based solutions haven't put that initial energy into the debt, debt capital markets so far. And I think that there is obviously still the additional question of getting authorised both in the UK and in the EU. So perhaps it's sort of not an immediate area of focus for um, government or even market participants. I think that's right. Um, I, I mean, there, there, there is a system they developed in Australia to do a secondary offer to retail after the, uh, the institutional offer. 
Lord, Lord Hill is actually looking at that and, and considering that. But um, I, I think the, the broad retail markets will take a while to uh, alter and there's a lot of other impediments and um, uh, obstacles to making that a success at the moment. But watch the space. Watch the space. I mean, clearly, uh, you know, Lord Hill's uh, proposals are very measured and they're very initial uh, and they're concentrating on some relatively quick gains, like not needing a prospectus when you go to an RIE. But um, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how the UK and Gibraltar develop their models. I think in the crowdfunding space, we've actually seen uh, uh, crowdfunding platforms uh, look at this area and they'd, they'd be good places to find out what the appetite is from the retail market because uh, they've actually a, a, a attacked that market much more than we've seen in the, in the, in the larger, more regulated space. Um, and they sit, so, so it seems that there is retail appetite for mini bonds and, and debt instruments, doesn't it? Oh, the, the, the it definitely is. Uh, it will require their reforms because... Part of the problem of crowdfunding is you've got a square concept that you're trying to fit into a round legal hell, and there's all sorts of um, uh, difficulties that you get into. But I think the liberalisation of the crowdfunding space would be an immense benefit to the UK uh, uh, economy. But I, I, I don't see that as top of the government list at the moment. But I think there's so much that could be done there. Um, Peter, just to add to that, you understand the sort of the crowdfunding market much better than I do, and I don't really understand the regulatory framework for it. But I sometimes think that if we, as an industry, think that the government could do more to sort of facilitate these markets, or if there are barriers to um, sort of the expansion of these markets, then we need as an industry to sort of get better at um, sort of advocacy and making these points to government and explaining the fixes and the barriers, because I don't think that, because they, they, they won't necessarily understand them. So I think that this is another sort of interesting consequence of Brexit is that we're now having to do sort of two parallel sets of advocacy. We're having to make points both to um, UK or Gibraltar policymakers, and then also make those points again to um, European Commission and the European supervisory authorities. But but twas ever thus. I mean, even within the UK, the Treasury will take one view on crowdfunding, and there are uh, all party parliamentary groups looking at um, uh, what could be done. And you've got an, an FCA that is schooled. Uh, and entrenched in its uh, EU mentality. Now, in the short term, that's probably a good thing because, as we've been discussing, it means that there aren't very radical differences or problems for issuers and business continues as usual. But I think over time, uh, we, we, we might see that uh, evolve. But I think the general message at the moment is there isn't a lot of change. Culturally, the FCA is the right hand of government that doesn't know what the left hand wants to do, uh, but it's, it's leading to a relatively low change scenario at the moment. But it does sort of uh, offer possibilities for the future, which I think are quite exciting. Yeah, I think it's that, it's that sort of... Sorry, go ahead, Peter. Uh, sorry, I was actually going to say it's a slightly off tangent, but it's to your point about there being an open door, I think, there with the UK government. I, we're seeing it in in terms of uh, discussions about stable coins in the blockchain space and um, uh, uh, CBDC, you know, cent central bank digital currencies. Um, uh, uh, and what's really interesting, I think, is the the UK government realizes that this divergence opportunity if it's managed carefully allows the uk and gibraltar uh, to move much more quickly than it might otherwise so uh, it might otherwise do um, and so we're actually the the ability for example to uh, move ahead on the regulation of um, uh, uh, backed um, cryptocurrencies so-called stable coins um, now that we're outside of the EU, could give the UK and Gibraltar a very good, uh, a very significant competitive advantage. So I think you're absolutely right. What we seem to be hearing is if you've got an idea of how you can improve trade and, uh, you know, and, and increase efficiency um, and uh, market capital deployment, then, you know, you, you should push forward and explain what we could do. And sometimes it might involve, quite frankly, looking at what the EU is doing and trying to do it better and quicker, you know, and that, that, that is not a bad idea.
um, uh, and we should be looking at that as well as looking what other jurisdictions do. Gents, and can I just sorry? Sorry, go ahead, Eric. Go ahead, Nick. I was just going so to say, I, we're, gonna... I, I hate to interrupt a great conversation, but we've got 20 minutes to go and my iPhone is burning with questions. But Eric, go ahead and then I'll move on to the next question. So just final remark on this. So Simon sort of made the point that in the immediate aftermath of the UK having sort of regulatory control in this area, the Financial Conduct Authority has been so, so perhaps cautious or... Um, is taking, let's say, an evolutionary approach rather than a revolutionary approach. Now, I think that sort of Peter sort of raised the point that what's the point of being outside the single market if you don't do things differently and you don't consider sort of potential competitive advantages? Now, this is going to be a big debate that's never going to finish. There are going to be some people within the industry that will prefer a more convergent approach with the EU, there will be others that will prefer a more divergent approach. And already I'm seeing sort of this debate happening in um, various working groups that I'm part of. So the, uh, the battle's only just commenced. Okay, European issuers um, question. So European entities wishing to offer to UK investors, how could or what benefits may be deemed by using Gibraltar as a gateway into the UK? I think Peter may be why don't you kick off with that one? Is Peter on mute? Yeah, I think to go back to something that Eric's made the, the point consistently uh, on is that uh, we also need to always, when, asked, when thinking about questions like this, we need to work out what kind of issue are we talking about? Um, at the moment, we've been talking largely about issues that do not require um, a degree of uh, harmonization or, or mutual recognition um, because the regimes are uh, largely the same. I think if you're talking about the issue to retail, as we mentioned, it becomes much more complex and a question as to um, uh, whether to use Gibraltar um, or the UK even. Um, I think in terms of, uh, uh, if, we, if, we, if we look at what uh, the Gibraltar Stock Exchange is uh, currently doing, I think, uh, and, and as Eric said, that, that you know, we're not seeing much change in terms of Gibraltar's attractiveness there, then I think it's really a question for, for you, Nick, actually, which is why, why use the stock exchange if they can use it, which, which they can, and we've, we've, you know, Eric's explained uh, very nicely why you can continue to uh, issue on the exchange. So why, why do you think they're coming to you rather than in, in, uh, uh, issuing in, uh, in London? I think because um, I think there's a, there's a couple of reasons. I think as as we as we've discussed at length during this panel, I think at the moment there's very much a wait and see and see what evolves. But I think what we've tried to do is to position ourselves as a you know a commercially attractive, faster market, flexible jurisdiction. You know we have a great relationship uh, with our with our regulator, etc. So I think that's part of the um, Part of the, I think, the offering, you know, we're we're small enough and hungry enough and uh, flexible enough to uh, to you know to to try to turn things around extremely quickly. So I think, and also I think our you know financial offering is 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 uh, more than competitive, and I think that's starting to gain traction with uh you know with with the bigger uh, with the big issuers. So I think um and you know we're going to continue to to press that. And obviously, look as a as a clarity comes through as to you know passporting rights into the UK. Uh, with Gibraltar positioning itself as a portal, I think that can only add to um, the attractiveness of this as a jurisdiction, because I think as a an offering to European issuers and in fact global issuers, uh, which uh, you know call them third country, uh, if Gibraltar can, BSX can position itself as that portal, then uh, I think that's very uh, very compelling. I think the other point I don't know how relevant it is uh, for the current clients uh, that the stock exchange has, but I think the other point of interest for Gibraltar is. Um, in addition to the UK focused activity where Gibraltar's relationship uh, and understanding with the UK is very important and yeah. um, what we really what we really see is a lot of people looking at the rest of the world um, and we haven't really talked about that much but it's very important when you consider the extent to which someone can do something in Gibraltar or the UK um, and that can be used for um, activities or customers in other parts of the globe and we're really seeing a lot of interest in that space and, and also from uh, European uh, uh, entities um, and uh, high net worth individuals. 
who are looking much you know they're looking much more broadly than just at what can i do in the eu yep okay supplements will one supplement suffice for both the uk and the eu or will we need two separate supplements over to you panel so i can begin with this one so broadly exactly the same points that we're making about prospectuses can also be made about prospectus supplements so a prospectus supplement that is approved in the eu isn't valid for regulatory purposes in the uk or gibraltar and vice versa if you have your sort of prospect so if you've got a prospectus that's supplemented in the uk that supplement doesn't count for eu purposes having said that the rules on when a prospectus supplement is required under the eu prospectus regulation and the uk prospectus regulation are exactly the same in both circumstances a supplement is required sort of under article 23 of both the uk prospectus regulation and the eu prospectus regulation if there is a significant new factor material mistake or material inaccuracy so we think that in practice where you've got a sort of a dual compliance scenario one document will be both sort of possible and advisable sort of to use for your supplement purposes in both the EU and the UK and those two sort of extremely quick parallel approval processes can sort of happen in both jurisdictions in a day or a couple of days okay transparency directive are there any changes to an issuer's reporting and publication requirements in the UK and GIP under the under the TD regime? I might start with that one too. So I think that this has been technically it's been difficult for us to reach the answer, but we think we now have reached the answer. Now the transparency regime is tricky because as a directive. It's not directly applicable in member states and it needed local member state implementation. It's also sort of called a minimum harmonization regime, which means that different member states are able to gold plate it. So there are slightly different rules depending on your home member state for transparency directive purposes. Having said that, we, we think that in practice, across the whole of the EU and also if you consider the UK and Gibraltar there were broadly the same rules in place whatever member state you are you're in now so we think that even if previously you had the UK as your home member state and now you have I don't know an EU um, member state as your home member state for transparency directive purposes your the substantive filing obligations that you will be subject to have not changed in a material way. Now, they have perhaps changed in some of the slight details. You now may be required to make your filing using a different entity. Um, and there may be sort of certain differences in the language requirements that you need to make your filings in. But we think, and it has been sort of, sort of tricky maybe explaining to issuers what these these small changes are and how to comply with them but we think that currently where we are is that for the majority of um, issuers they've now um, sort of publicly confirmed their new home member state for transparency directive purposes and have managed to sort of get on top relatively quickly of how the source of the new obligations applied to them and sort of reached a view that in practice not much has changed so that's a sort of a long answer to saying don't need to worry too much about this question and if you yeah if you look at for example the obligation on investors under the dtr i mean the form for people who have a, um, a substantial interest in public uh, companies and um, it hasn't really changed you know that the, the platform at the fca has changed um, you now need to do an electronic submission rather than an email submission but the form looks the same as it did three years ago practically doesn't it it does it's going to be I, I think it's sort of somewhat interesting that how much for burden is it going to be upon issuers to put the same information 
in two different formats. Now, that's really a question that we as lawyers, to me, it doesn't seem like a massive burden, but obviously we have to accept that it is a new obligation. I think issuers will sort of tell us whether they think that this is sort of so much hassle for them that they need to reconsider trading venue. But so far, I think that there's still a sort of a wait and see approach. I, I, I don't think it'll make very much uh, difference. I mean, you, we had lots of uh, uh, companies in London have had lots of the dual listed. You make two disclosures, two separate, two completely different regimes. You just get the uh, the people making the submission trained up to do it. It's nothing much. I mean, I mean that's probably right because some of these large, some sort of sophisticated issuers or sort of many issuers that have um, filings, maybe requirements also in the United States, which is sort of totally different and on the basis of a sort of very different regulatory framework. If issuers have previously been able to sort of comply with these obligations, then complying with both the UK and the EU rules shouldn't be too much of a burden. There were probably also some things that the UK government could do unilaterally to ease the burden and maybe sort of make it easier to recognise EU filings within the UK unilaterally. We'll see whether they uh, take advantage of some of these options. I think there is a movement in that direction anyway to incorporate more and more stuff by reference. Uh, it's, it's it's a general theme we're seeing in regulation. I don't know where we'll end up, but plenty are doing it already, and it's not, you, you know, a top of already the burdens that you have to meet. This is just a little cherry on the top. Okay, we've got four more questions, which I'd love to try and get answered before the nine minutes are up. Uh, in fact, we've got five more questions. So, um, okay, what process do wholesale exempt offers? in brackets, e.g. institutional offerings, close brackets, need to follow when aimed at both UK and EEA professional investors? So not that much changed from before the end of the Brexit implementation period. As mentioned, um, offerings aimed at wholesale investors are exempt from the requirement to publish a prospectus under both the EU prospectus regulation and the UK prospectus regulation. Having said that, you may, for these transactions, often see a prospectus because, for example, there is an admission to trading on a regulated market in either the EU or the UK or Gibraltar. Now, so just in terms of sort of process, from a sort of a documentation perspective, you would normally expect to see a sort of a set of legends and um, selling restrictions that now look sort of different from and much longer than the ones that we saw before the end of the Brexit implementation period. But your process for sort of doing offerings hasn't changed dramatically. And um, so we're con continuing to see a great deal of act activity in the wholesale debt markets across the European region that we that we have always seen. Okay, um, SPACs. So there's been a large increase in SPAC issues this year, particularly in the US. Are we seeing a difference in terms of how the UK and EU regulators approach SPACs? Hmm, who would like to take that one? Well, we I, I, th I, th I think there's um, clearly uh, a lot of interest in the UK in following the American model. I think it's one of the things Lord Hill has been looking at. Uh, Xavier Rolle, the former CEO of the London Stock Exchange, is still held in, a Frenchman still held in very high regard in London, has been uh, advocating their use. I, I think we will see the adoption, we will see some liberalisation. Personally, I'm not entirely sure they're all they're cracked up to be because you do need to set your investment parameters. If they're going to do a transaction at the moment, they're suspended. The suggestion is that they're not suspended, but that probably means you have to do a little bit more disclosure up front so you don't have a wild share price uh, bouncing about. But I'm pretty sure they're going to come to London. I'm pretty sure they'll come to London before they, um, uh, before they make much of an appearance across Europe. Mm. Okay, thank you. Okay, does Gibraltar 
Does Gibraltar have its own PRIPs and prospectus regulations separate from the UK? Can an issuer not rely on the UK language included in a prospectus approved for the UK? So, Peter? Yes, um, well, a lot of, some of this is being, uh, is subject to, you know, we mentioned that there's the uh, development of the Gibraltar authorization regime. So we've got, we've still got some open questions as we, uh, uh, to be resolved. As we, as we mentioned, the, um, broadly speaking across the whole range of financial services, we have um, a deemed passporting um, of, uh, ability. Uh, but in terms of the uh, mechanics of how prospectuses will work when issued in the UK um, uh, or, or approved, sorry, how the approval process will, will work between Gibraltar and the UK and those two competent authorities. I still think there's some open questions there what the Gibraltar authorization regime will need to, to, to deal with. Um, that said, the FCA approving a prospectus, if that's what we're talking about, um, which I think we are, the FCA approving a prospectus for listing on the stock exchange um, is is uh, is something that um, uh, that uh, we don't need to have a full um, default authorization regime in place in order to to, to have that. So, in practice, um, the FCA's approval is needed for prospectus offerings. Um, and so uh, the Gibraltar listings that require a prospectus will be able to be able to um, take advantage of that. Is that your understanding, Eric? You're the expert on this. So yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not I, so I think that if we look at sort of the jurisdictional scope of the UK PRIPS regulation and the UK prospectus regulation, it doesn't extend to... Um, admissions to the Gibraltar Stock Exchange and um, but I think that you're sort of right under the um, the arrangements between the UK and Gibraltar a prospectus approved for UK purposes can be used in Gibraltar now Gibraltar also has its own sort of parallel set of regulation that applies within its own jurisdiction now, one of these sort of interesting questions, which I don't think anyone quite knows the answer to, is how close Gibraltar's regulatory framework will be to the, the UK's regulatory framework. And there is obviously scope for some differences. Now, it may be that the UK government and Her Majesty's Treasury want to keep the Gibraltar framework and the UK framework closely aligned with each other. But it may also be that there are the scope for differences and the scope for sort of exploring different regulatory possibilities within Gibraltar that don't apply to the wider UK. And I think it's also a question for the sort of the industry within Gibraltar and the government of Gibraltar as to what their preferences are. It may be that they have um, some different views in some areas. So I don't know the answer to that. I, th I think what we're seeing in the um, in the bill and the discussions for the authorization regime is the um, is a is an understanding that there will be a very close degree of uh, harmonization but with the ability for the UK authorities to be able to decide a bit like you have under some European legislation now um, some super consumer type um, uh, uh, prohibitions where effectively the U UK will want to be able to say look there is um, acceptance uh, recognition is a is a common market, but if uh, it, uh, in most respects, but if we find that there are certain things that happen in Gibraltar that we're not comfortable with from a UK, particularly UK consumer perspective, um, then th th there is like you know they're going to want to retain some powers there. So that's why I think the focus is much it's much less relevant for these the discussions we're having about um, offers for um, the wholesale market. On a smaller, on a smaller um, point on this one, if I can jump in, uh, we have seen from a stock exchange perspective some documents which were initially designed and drafted for the UK market uh, for being approved by the FCA. In terms of uh, uh, using those documents for listing on the Gibraltar stock exchange, uh, at the stage right now, given the, the requirements are pretty largely the same, uh, but just the issue uh, made a few tweaks really to the language, mostly to the references to the 
uh, prips. You got uh, UK prips, they're just pretty much the same for Gibraltar. You have Gibraltar prips or uh, sort of, uh, you know, ju just just very small tweaks to the references. Probably, uh, as you, you, you said, uh, Eric, uh, it will likely change, and it's interesting to see how you know there will be some divergence. But at the moment, uh, the the prospectus largely um, you know comply with the requirements for the exchange and the jurisdiction. Uh, just a few, very few tweaks required, and we've done that in a couple of uh, instances over the last few months. Yeah, and I, I I think that's likely to continue. There's already a, a a great cultural convergence between Gibraltar and the UK, just as you know a lot of Irish legislation was um, pretty much uh, copied from the UK, uh, and the great cultural convergence is there. Where you might find some divergences on new types of products, I don't think you'll see very much if it involves UK retail offerings for all the reasons that we enunciated previously. But again, there is some scope for divergence in respect to new products, institutional products, and we'll have to see how that pans out. Uh, but I think that's likely to be exciting. Okay, thank you, everybody. And as I said at the beginning, um, if you if you were looking for a tonic, I think the last hour and a half hopefully have has certainly provided that. Uh, I think that was an excellent, excellent discussion. And thank you to our panelists, Eric, Peter, and Simon. I think it was absolutely superb. So um, it just leads me to say thank you very much to all of the participants for attending. We really appreciate you turning up. Thank you very much. I hope you found that as informative as uh, as I did. And um, if you'd like to know any more, anything else, please just go to gsx.gi and we'll be, we'll be uh, very happy to, to help you in any way we can. Other than that, it just leads me to say thank you very much. Uh, stay safe and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you very much indeed.